Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you back uh, after our little summer break uh, to the Mesa City Council meeting. This is the Mesa City Council meeting for August the 15th. Uh, all of our council is present. The first item on our agenda for this meeting is to review the agenda for our meeting on Monday. So council, please refer to that document. I know we've got a few staff presentations on some of the items on, uh, on this agenda. Um, the first one I'm aware of is item 6I, but I think, it, is there a, council, you have a question before we get to 6I? Mr. I did, Thompson. Mayor, thank you. Um, on item 6A, uh, let me get there. 6A, 6-alpha. Um, for the assigning two, two Mesa police officers to DEA, I was just curious, do we currently have two officers assigned to DEA or are we assigning two officers to DEA? And, um, and this is covering, it's the 37,000 that's being added uh, to cover the overtime. Uh, but if we don't have an officer, officers assigned to DEA already, then why not cover the full cost? And then how is this helping Mesa? Uh, Mesa? Because just looking at um, the issues that we have in Mesa and the fact that we're uh, spread a little bit thin right now on personnel. I'm just concerned about giving up additional officers to another organization. So. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Um, I, I agree with you. You're absolutely right. We're all concerned about that. But this, uh, these two positions are positions that already exist with the DA. One of the officers is actually embedded with the DEA task force, um, and they work cases that are impacting uh, Mesa with respect to narcotics. They have a very large investigation. Um, that's a spin-off from multiple ones over the past couple of years that they're working right now as part of that task force. The other position is a part-time officer, so he actually um, is here with our folks in Mesa, work in Mesa case most of the time. When the DEA needs some assistance, then he provides some assistance with them. And so the, these funds are to um, provide overtime for any additional activities that they might incur during the course of their investigations. Thank you very much. Um, other questions or concerns about the agenda? Um, I know on item 6F, uh, having to do with the uh, regional uh, project on homelessness, uh, Christy, uh, Natalie, thank you, Natalie. Can, this looks, uh, I think, I know we're all very interested in this. Yes, Thanks for your morning. work on homelessness. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Mayor and Council, and welcome back. Um, this is a little unusual, and so we just thought we would give you a quick update on, on what we're doing here, because um, honestly, this whole resolution, our city manager has the authority to continue regional conversations about homelessness, but all of the cities that are involved in this are coming to our governing bodies as a statement of solidarity to say, we believe that homelessness is a regional issue and not just a parochial one, and it's in our interest to have regional conversations and seek regional solutions with each other and share information with each other. And so that's why we're bringing this resolution to you today. It doesn't commit Mesa to any resources at this point. Um, it's only a message of sol um, solidarity that we as East Valley Cities want to continue these conversations, look into different solutions. And if something does come up that requires resources in the future, we would come before you and talk to you about that and get your approvals. sense of which other cities are involved? Mostly it's East Valley cities at this point. Um, so we're talking about um, Mesa, Scottsdale, Chandler, Tempe, <clears throat> um, Gilbert, um, and, and Phoenix has also been involved in these conversations. And Mayor, can I just say, um, we want to really express our um, appreciation to the city of Tempe yes. and their city manager for who's really kind of taking the lead. lead on this and pulling us all together and staying on top of it. So it, but it is um, a, an interesting opportunity where kind of the East Valley has just taken the initiative on its own with the lead from Tempe to get, get together. And we've had, I don't know how many different meetings, Natalie, have we've had? Six or so. Seven, seven already. <clears throat> and this is just to continue that. The, um, some of the cities felt like it was just important to have an awareness and endorsement from the governing bodies so that as we move forward, it was known. Um, and shared with everyone. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and all the other cities too that are coming to the table have noticed the same thing that Mesa has, that there is a growing unsheltered population. So it was a good timing for all of us. Yeah, let me just give my uh, endorsement and thanks to what you've done to this point. I think we all know that we deal with uh, this issue at, at, at MAG at, on the continuum of care uh, uh, process uh, at, a, at that regional basis, but I think we have all acknowledged that that by definition, homeless people you know don't have a home, and, and so the, this is a regional, uh, particularly in the East Valley, a regional population <coughs> that we share. And so I know that the city managers in the East Valley have been meeting for many months now uh, to craft a, a common response to this. And so thank you for doing that. And, and I appreciate that this is really just formalizing that and acknowledging that that's taking place uh, so that we can give you the support and the political uh, support to that as well. So uh, I, I certainly uh, am grateful for what you've been doing and, and would look forward to what's gonna come out of that process. Um, thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments on that, Council? Uh, I think the next uh, item on this agenda where we're going to get some staff uh, support is on 6I. Uh, this is uh, authorizing, th this is a, a happy day, authorizing the defe defeasance and redemption of, of bonds. Good Tell morning, Mayor, Council members. Thank you. I apologize. Um, my name is Mike Kennington. I'm a Deputy City Manager, and I'm excited to be here today. And this is a, a day long time coming, as the Mayor said. Uh, at first, I'd like to acknowledge the many hours of st uh, staff time that have been put into this project, including our uh, financial advisor and our bond council as well. And especially, I want to highlight the, the time that the working group of uh, Natalie Lewis, our city attorney, Jim Smith, and Kim Fallbeck and her team in real estate have spent on this. I think it's almost close to a decade they've, been, uh, they've spent on the sale of the Pinal County lands, which we'll discuss here in this uh, presentation. Uh, first, uh, let me remind you where we started from. And in 2013, uh, we sold, uh, we issued $94 million of principal and excise tax revenue obligations or bonds. And the proceeds of this bond was used for the construction and renovation of our two baseball uh, spring training facilities. Uh, at the same time, before construction began and before we issued the bonds, we identified the funding source was to be the farm land that the city owned in Pinal County. This sale was structured in three phases, with the, with the first phase, uh, the initial closing in December of 2013. Between the phases, the City of Mesa was to receive lease revenue that, would, that was structured to pay for the debt service of the excise tax bonds. The second phase was closed in uh, June of 2017, and shortly thereafter, we had enough proceeds to pay for $45 million uh, off, pay off the bond, $45 million of the bond. The third phase uh, was just completed in June of this year, and I'm happy to say we're at, at the position to be able to pay off the remaining amount of the excise tax bonds that we issued in 2013 with the defeasance. So the, the and I won't go over uh, the, all these bullets here because we've talked about defeasance in the past, but if I'd, I'd love to answer any questions if you have any, but I really want to emphasize the third bullet. If the council authorizes this defeasance, we would be able to save, the city would save $22 million of interest cost uh, we would avoid by paying off the bonds. So that's, I probably should have put that bullet first, but uh, here it is on the, on the, on the defeasance <coughs> slide as the third bullet. And finally, these two projects, the, the, the sale of the land in Pinal County and the excise tax bonds were intertwined, and so let me just present the results here. Uh, after the, the last uh, phase of the sale, we collected approximately $134 million of sale proceeds and lease revenue. And if the council approves the authorization of the, of the defeasance uh, of the excise tax bonds, we would have paid approximately $124 million of uh, principal and interest uh, cost for this financing. And if the council approves this defeasance, uh, we would get the final numbers next week and we would close the defeasance transaction at the beginning of next month. With that, those are my prepared remarks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So, Mayor and Council, we've been, <laughs> for some of us, been working on this for a long time. <clears throat> and so what's remarkable about this is when we had made the decision to keep the Cubs in Mesa, Arizona, uh, at about the same time, right after that, we also had the, we were approached by the Oakland A's about moving into the space that um, the Cubs were vacating. And so because we were in a position, um, because of the land that the city had purchased back in the late 80s, I want to say, is that pretty close? 
um, which for other purposes was to assure water rights, but that actually never materialized, and there were some state laws that were passed that prohibited that from uh, us dipping our straw in Pinal County and pumping it to <laughs> Mesa. But we were able to, I think this is what's remarkable, is we've been able to now pay off our spring training facilities, which generate millions of dollars a year to the city of Mesa, and we're able to pay it off in a very short period of time. So we opened up spring training, what, 2014, 2013, 2014? So five years, we've now debt-free on both facilities, and we've taken 10,000, 11,000 acres of land that was we were collecting nominal rent from farmers on, and we've taken that asset, and now we've converted it into spring training facilities. So you think about the productivity of what we were getting from farmland, now what we've converted that into is spring training facilities. Um, so this is, I think, a remarkable um, conclusion to a long road, it seems like, but I think we've served the citizens of Mesa very well. There's very few communities can say they've paid off their stadiums in five years, and as Mike said, saved $22 million in interest costs, and now, going forward, every dollar that we generate out of the, um, during spring training is clear and free. We don't have, there's no other, other than the operating costs, there's no debt service payments to um, net out against it. So this is a big day. We know that the Chicago Cubs are actually very excited about this too. Um, they, they've sent their congratulations to the city um, and they're very much um, uh, supportive of, of this action. So thank you very much. Mr. Thompson. I know this is probably a conversation for later, but any of the savings we, we realize from not paying on the debt service for the stadiums, can we, is there a way to transfer that to the PSPRS pay down? <laughs> we can, uh, there's, a, there's a long list of things that we could use the money for, so we can have that discussion at some point, yes. Yes, Mr. Luna. Um, you know, we really have to thank the council from 2010 and their forward thinking. I know Mayor yep. uh, Scott Smith yep. uh, uh, promised voters that, that this is what they would do uh, to pay down the debt. And I think that's why voters approved uh, having this both stadiums. So so we need to thank the leadership of council during that point. So yeah. thank probably you, the, council, if you're here. Yeah, it's probably the only election ever where you'll see the voters favor, favored almost 80 percent right. were in favor of that initiative on the ballot. And that was during the height of the recession. Oh, absolutely. So, 2000, 2010. 2010. 2010, 2010 yeah. So we really need to acknowledge yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. Have we given some thought to maybe a little ceremony to, uh, to, to tear There's up? There's been a lot of people organs. asking that question, Mayor. So yeah. we are, um, you know, Monday we'll take the formal action, but we were thinking maybe something early next week. I don't know. We're looking for a big paid in full stamp or something yeah. we can use. Well, to, to, to Mr. Luna's point, I was thinking it might be nice to invite those uh, the kids yeah, members I, out. Yeah, I agree. That, that did um, that. A lot of them had to stand out in front of this uh, yeah. issue um, and make promises. So I think that'd be a, a yeah. good thing to do. Yeah, we can work on that, Mayor. Well, this, this really is cause for celebration and, and not to, to crow at the expense of other people, but I think this also really puts us uh, in, at the envy of the rest of the Cactus League. Uh, to, to have these stadiums paid off, really, that's quite unusual. Yeah, and many of them are waiting to get um, funding from um, the regional sports authority. Yeah. Um, we have money coming to us, but we'll be able to use, and we can only use it for the... Um, um, a stadium, but we'll be using that to do the improvements, maintenance, and upkeep as opposed to paying off debt. So, but yeah, there's a lot of cities out there that are still waiting for payments on their debt that they issued to build their stadiums. They're still waiting to get those payments. Okay. Well, uh, heartfelt congratulations to everyone that has uh, made this happen. So, thank you for your hard work. So that, that we'll, we'll keep that on the uh, consent agenda, <laughs> but uh, we, we might uh, somehow, we'll continue to point out that this is a cause for celebration. Um, other, I, I know uh, item 8A, I think we also have a, a staff presentation on that that we're updating. Ryan got on. all dressed up, so we, right. we got to have him come yeah, up and say you. something. So. Like this every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, this, so we're updating our nuisance codes and we appreciate learning more about that. Good morning, Mayor and Council. 
I know we, uh, we came to you in 2018 with some proposed changes to the nuisance code, uh, and we ended up only making a few of those at the time. And we are back with some of the recommended changes back from 2018 and some additional ones now in 2019. <clears throat> a lot of these recommended changes that uh, we are making uh, are based on public input. We get a lot of, as you can imagine, we get a lot of uh, interaction and input from the public on things that they would like code compliance to do. Uh, the first three real main changes are kind of improving the clarity with regards to illegal dumping and property maintenance. Uh, and they are, uh, all we're doing is kind of expanding our definitions a little bit to make it clearer as far as citizen responsibility for the property. We've included things like alleys in there, so it's, it's clear to them that in a gated alley that that citizen is now responsible for it, uh, as well as uh, adjacent properties and the curtilage. The, so the first three changes are primarily uh, similar uh, in nature in that um, they just, they just kind of clear up the definitions in uh, these areas as to citizen responsibility for the, the maintenance of those. Uh, this next one that uh, we're recommending is residential addresses required on residences. It's currently in the Mesa Fire Code. Code compliance doesn't enforce the Mesa Fire Code. So we wanted to mimic it and mirror it and put it in our, our nuisance code. It's primarily a safety issue for first responders. We wanna make sure our police and firefighters when they're going to a residence in the middle of the night for some type of emergency, that they're easily able to identify which residence they need to go to. And by having uh, a requirement that their address is posted on their house, we don't see this as an enforcement issue. We see it as a educational issue for residents. Uh, we would like uh, to be able to provide actually citizens numbers uh, if they don't have it on their house. Uh, and you can see in this picture here, it can be on a, on a wall out front. It could be on their residence. There's a number of ways that they'd be able to post it. The next one is regards storage of recreational vehicle and watercraft. So currently in the city of Mesa, you're not allowed to park your boat in your driveway. It has to be in your garage, in your side yard. Well, what we've come to realize and through our interactions with our citizens is that uh, people use their boats like they do their recreational vehicles. They pull it out the day before, they load it, they go spend time at the lake with their families, and then when they come back, they spend a day or two unloading it and cleaning it. So by uh, this recommended change, we're allowing the citizens to keep those, that boat in their driveway or in the roadway in front of their house for up to 48 hours to load, unload, and clean. Uh, additionally, uh, currently recreational storage is uh, on residential parcels wasn't exactly clear as to how many you're, you're allowed on a residential parcel. So we clearly spelled out that you're allowed one per residential parcel. And currently based on the size of your lot was based on the size of the recreational, which vehicle you were permitted to have on your lot. Uh, we're actually re waiving those, our recommendation is to waive those limitations. If you have a recreational vehicle and it fits in your backyard, behind as you can see this, this picture in here would be an example of it. If it fits behind your six foot fence, uh, then you're allowed to store it there. Wow. The uh, prohibited feeding of pigeons and dove, which uh, everybody uh, has nicknamed me the pigeon guy now. So <coughs> this stems from Tempe's ordinance, Phoenix's ordinance. When those came out in the last year, We've got lots and lots of citizen input requesting that the city of Mesa mimic that ordinance to over here and prohibit the uh, feeding of pigeons and doves. And in the last six months, I've done more research and found out more things about pigeons than I ever really wanted to know. Uh, what I've learned is the pigeons and doves are pretty much the same species. They're the Columba Day species. Uh, in the United States, we call pigeons uh, pigeons, but they're actually a, a species of dove. It's a rock dove. So what, uh, <laughs> uh, this, this recommended change is primarily based on uh, health and sanitation. Uh, probably too much information to you to know, but uh, pigeons and doves can defecate up to 30 times a day. <laughs> and uh, it creates a significant health and sa sanitation issues in our neighborhoods. So uh, when people, when citizens feed them on a regular basis, it increase, they come back to it every day, and not just that individual's residence, but the, the surrounding residents, they'll roost on and they'll hang out there and they'll create that mess. Uh, 
But our, our ordinance does uh, mimic in many ways the ones in Tempe and Phoenix and our surrounding uh, cities around the Southwest. Okay. There is an exception in there. If people have homing pigeons or have pigeons in a cage that they have as a pet, we wouldn't limit lim placing limitations on that. Uh, in the last 24 hours since uh, I did an interview in the media, I've been getting a lot of people who have been calling and clarifying. So I want to make sure that everybody knows also, there is not a limitation. You can have a hummingbird feeder in your yard, no problem. You can have smaller feeders that would still feed finches. And I know in the East Valley, we have a, a big population of peach-faced parrots. A lot of people call them lovebirds. That it wouldn't be prohibited. Just, just the pigeons and doves would be the limitations if approved. You're right. We, we do now know more about pigeons than we wanted to. But, uh, and I can't erase it, Mayor, from my Mr. mind. Freeman, uh, <laughs> Mr. Freeman wants to continue the conversation, so go ahead. Well, I'm going to change it just a tad. Since we're prohibiting pigeons and, or doves, what about feral cats? I know that I've had a lot of requests on that. And people go out and feed them, and other organizations will come to alleys and others to feed feral cats to allow them to uh, live in those neighborhoods or areas. So do we have anything, I mean, cats, I know eat pigeons and doves, but we don't have <laughs> enough of either But to do that. But what are your, uh, did you do any research on that? Or? I did not do any research on that. Mayor I know Council. that's a little. But th so I think that would be a discussion with animal control. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions about that over the years, and there are some very passionate people about feral Correct. cats. So we can have that conversation, but that would, we'd want to bring in our um, animal control officers. They deal with that. Um, and I've had that conversation with them. They don't, yeah. but it doesn't they don't do code. anything with them. But yeah, we don't I, just, I just thought along the same scenario, if you're targeting doves and pigeons, are we going to move over to the other side? So just something to think about, food for thought. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, our last recommended changes is an increase in the minimum sanctions uh, for our code violations. It's been uh, almost 14 years since we've adjusted these in the, in the ordinance. So as you can see here, our first offense uh, is currently $150. It would go up to $250. Second offense, $250 to $350. And we kept the third offense at $500. Uh, after the third offense, as you may know, it becomes a criminal offense as a habitual offender class one misdemeanor that goes over to city court for prosecution and traditionally fines for class one misdemeanors are 500. So we didn't want to surpass that next step. Uh, I just want to emphasize with this uh, that our civil hearing officer has the ability to reduce, to waive fines of which uh, our civil hearing officer currently does. A lot of times people will come in and they will have a violation and they've since corrected it since issuing the citation. And a lot of times we will offset that sanction based on how much money that citizen has spent uh, to fix that problem. So if they spent $150 to have uh, their yard, their landscaper, that $150 gets offset from their, their fine on that one. So our next steps uh, would be, uh, it would be introduced on August 19th. Uh, council action will be on the 26th of August. And if approved, it would go into uh, effect on the 30th of September. Any other questions? <clears throat> no, thank you very much. Council, any additional questions? I'm sorry, Mr. <laughs> Freeman. Thank you. I talked to Ryan quite a bit, Natalie, about this. So in the beginning, you talked about the uh, uh, property maintenance. <clears throat> and we, we earlier this year, we talked about a pilot program to pick up the trash and other issues within our community. Is that going to be able to parlay into what you're doing here and we can offer trash pickup and on the city right of ways and versus uh, alleyways and things like that? How, how is that going to project out? Mayor and Vice Mayor Freeman, it, it is, it, it's progressing and I would look for uh, RJ for an update on how it's coming on his side. But from the code compliance perspective, we have identified several areas that would benefit from this. We're still increasing our partnership with uh, transportation. And a lot of those changes that I talked about are geared to make it uh, more efficient for the city in that pro with regards to that program. Uh, Thanks, RJ. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Vice Mayor, uh, yes, we're in the process right now of actually hiring two staff uh, and acquiring equipment as well uh, to allow us to do more proactive um, cleanup. Uh, right now, we have one person who patrols the city on a regular basis. We call it hazardous response. 
Um, so if there's mattresses in the street, blocking sidewalks, that kind of thing, he'll typically move and do the best he can. We'll, we'll scale up if there's larger dump areas uh, using our right-of-way crew. Um, but the addition of the, the two staff plus a solid waste truck and a, uh, a loader will help us be a lot more efficient. Uh, so what I see is this kind of working like a graffiti program, our graffiti abatement program, where our first priority is call-ins or uh, people using the CityLink app, and that's our first priority is a 24-hour response. Um, but the person we have assigned to that knows where the graffiti is. So actually 70% of the work he does is self-identified. And what I see with the uh, right-of-way uh, program is something similar, <clears throat> where we respond to issues, whether it's a referral uh, from Ryan's staff or something we get from a citizen, uh, but then getting our folks proactively out into the areas that we know are problems and actually developing kind of a maintenance routine. So uh, we're excited about that, and I think we'll continue our partnership with, with, uh, with code enforcement and uh, move this thing along. And RJ, the equipment we're buying too will, um is sized to also um, access the alleyways, correct? Am I that's, saying that right? that's a conversation I'm having with our staff. Oh, they, okay. They, they want a larger piece of equipment. Uh -huh. I, I'm more of your line of thought, uh, Mr. Brady. Um, but what will help us a lot is having a, a loader, a small loader that can grab. One of the concerns we have is this material is kind of nasty. Um, Maybe some birds landed on it. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, before, we, before we get to it, um, but it'll, it'll help keep our folks safe as well, that they're not having to put hands on uh, as much of the material that they're currently picking up. Well, thank, I know from my perspective in, in some of my district, I have apartment complexes that they seem to, when they leave, they put everything out on the sidewalk and et cetera. So I know we've talked about that, and I appreciate you doing taking care of that. Um, I have one other question for... Uh, Lieutenant Russell, but inoperable vehicles. Yes, sir. Uh, we've had this conversation, Natalie and, and yourself, about is that going to be included in this ordinance update at all? Because maybe you can explain how many inoperable vehicles can be on properties. And uh, we've had an issue in my district about that. And I'm sure all of us in our respective districts may have. How many inoperable vehicles can I have on a property? And so, Mayor and Vice Mayor Freeman and Council, so this is uh, Mesa's ordinance as it currently reads is kind of unique compared to our surrounding agencies. So most other, most other cities, uh, they either don't regulate this or if they do, the number's pretty consistently two to three inoperable vehicles you're allowed in the rear of your lot, meaning your backyard, behind your fence. Um, Mesa, our current ordinance reads that you're allowed to have a certain amount based on the size of your lot, based on your zoning. So RS six and seven smaller lots, you're allowed three inoperable vehicles. RS nine all the way up through 35, so that third of a quarter of an acre up to three quarters of an acre, you're allowed to have five. And then acre and two acre lots, so the RS 43 and RS 90, RS 43 obviously being Lehigh would be the, the your area. Uh, you're allowed to have a maximum of seven inoperable vehicles on your lot. I know we have been in discussions uh, about coming back to council with some recommendations on maybe changing this. Seven seems like it might be a little high um, compared to our surrounding cities. I think Glendale is the next highest and they are at three, uh, but you can only have them there a maximum of uh, three in one calendar year. Uh, so they limit it and it's really geared towards project, people, inoperable vehicles working on projects. What we see a lot of the times in code compliance isn't people who are restoring their 1967 Mustang, it's a broken down vehicle that they're just having in their backyard. So to answer your question, yes, we are having discussions uh, about coming back with maybe some additional recommendations on that. Well, thank, I just want my colleagues to know that in my area, and I know that we responded to a code complaint with a gentleman that had <coughs> numerous inoperable vehicles on his property and in, in storage containers. And, uh, it, you know, it's just the neighborhood didn't like it. I mean, it was pretty excessive. So I think at some point, uh, I don't want to regulate what people could do in their backyards, but I think common sense should allow, you know, two or three inoperable vehicles and you're moving them around or if you're a hobbyist, you can work on them. And, and after that, uh, you know, if I could have seven on my property because I'm an RS-43, I mean, my, I'm sure my neighbors wouldn't like that. And, and if that, my neighbor next to me had another seven, you know, I'm pretty much becoming a junkyard. So I just entertain reducing that number. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Mr. Luna. Uh, just one comment. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for taking care of the pigeon situation. I know it was <laughs> my constituent that raised the issue, uh, asking to mimic what Phoenix and Tempe had done. So I know you spent a lot of time with my constituent and talked to him through this. And uh, uh, so we've also informed him that this is in the process. So I appreciate all the time that you've taken on, on the issue. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, what's uh, when we have these updates to the public, what's the public facing outreach or awareness that we do with with residents on this. as far as educating them on, yeah, on the changes on, yeah whenever we have these these types of updates or changes uh, on code uh, how do we how do we reach out or is there a plan to reach out as far as these updates what's the process there so uh, mayor and council very good question thank you uh, Whenever we do a change like this, I would anticipate that we do a period of education with the public. And, <clears throat> excuse me, none of these changes other than the pigeon one are that drastic that they're, that it's gonna be completely out of left field. They're, they're wording changes, maybe some standard changes on it. Um, and obviously code compliance officers would go out there, educate the public, hey, this is what we've, if you have this violation, this is a recent change. Uh, and that 14 day notice, obviously, we'd be very flexible with the public on that right there, as we always are. But th there would, we would start out with a significant educational component on this. And that's how I anticipate that the, the pigeon component will have to be. Well, it's probably good to note that this, is, I, this item is on the agenda for introduction. And so on Monday, there's an opportunity for the public to come and pull a blue card to speak about it. But then it's the, the hearing is going to be August 26. So we'll have a public hearing on that date as well. So uh, just through the, the council meeting process, we'll have a, a couple more opportunities to, to, for the public to come and ask questions and for us to, to publicize some of the changes that we're considering here. So council, other questions on this item? Thank you very much, Lieutenant. Thank Appreciate you, your hard Council. work on that. Uh, also, item 8C, uh, I, I, it's probably good to note that this uh, Council Member Heredia probably uh, could uh, <laughs> shout from the rooftops as it were. Uh, this is the northwest corner of Alma School and Southern. Uh, we're starting the process of, of that zoning change as well. So that, that's a, a, a very strategic piece of property in Mesa that's been behind the chain link fence for many years. And uh, it's good to see uh, that something is happening there. So. That's for introduction on the 26th as well. Question on 12C. Yes. We had a no vote on PNZ. I was just curious what the concern was. I'm sorry, 12, 12C? That's the one you were referring to, uh, right? I'm referring no. to 8, 8, 8C. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that? No. Unless I wrote it down wrong, give me one second. Uh, no, I, no, you didn't, because I, I see there is 12C <laughs> items not on the consent agenda. Sorry, I apologize. I thought you were talking about 12C. No. Uh, we can go to 12C, though. Yep, whenever you're finished. Yeah. Any other questions, items? Uh, let's talk about 12C. The, the question is there's a, a no vote on P and Z. Can uh, maybe someone from staff help us um, know what was going on there? Otto, are you here when that vote took place? I don't think you were. Were you? This was almost a year oh. ago. We'll have to go back to the minutes. We This happened. Am I correct in saying that has it been a year? Is that too far back, a year ago? That, that's correct. Correct, yeah, so we'd have to go back to the minutes. So let, let's just to set the stage on item 12, um, Mr. Freeman has, well, a, has a conflict on that, so it's off of the consent agenda yes, for that purpose. Yes, and I'll members of the council, that's a Lehigh Cove, um, and the consent, well, the dissent vote basically came from a PNZ member that believed that the location of the um, residential development was very close to the mine, and that was kind of the general concern from some of the neighbors. So that was his main um, issue why he voted against it. Okay. So uh, this is, it's off the consent agenda, even though it is just introducing it for a public hearing on the 26th. So that's item 12A. The reason it's off the consent agenda is because a council member has a conflict. Does that all make sense? Okay, Council, other questions on anything on our Monday agenda? <clears throat> Mr. Brady, any other uh, staff presentations on anything? We've covered it. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on then, the uh, second item on our agenda for this meeting is to acknowledge receipt of minutes of boards and committees. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, 
Uh, gentlemen, all in favor, please say aye. 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 I, I just have oh, I, I'm sorry, Jim. Quick thing. Um, it's a very small thing. It's a typo that's on the minutes for the Historic Preservation Board meeting. Um, if you can just adjust the uh, adjournment time. Okay. So uh, for that one agenda item, there's a, a typo on the, uh, the adjournment time. Okay. And it needs to be changed. Do you recall what it changed from what to what? I don't know yeah. what time they adjourned, but it says 6.67 p.m. Oh. Oh. Okay. That's okay. either 7.07 07 or it's something else. I don't know. It's probably <laughs> 57. Or, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we can. Okay. Great. Thank you for noticing that. So with, with, uh, with that exception, uh, <laughs> we have a motion to uh, approve the minutes. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next item is item three, to hear reports on meetings and conferences attended. I know we've all been uh, very busy the last few weeks. Mr. Luna. Uh, yes, I had the opportunity to attend the Hilo Hispanic Elected Local Officials Conference in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And uh, I held a presentation on smart cities and what the city of Mesa is doing relative to smart cities. So I, but I want to thank uh, Randy Policar. Randy, raise your hand. Randy, and and Travis Cutright and Ian Linson and uh, other departments, which really help uh, talk about what our city is doing relative to smart cities. And we're really ahead of the curve. So it's really exciting to present all the great things we're doing in the city of Mesa. But they were really impressed with City Link. And so I thought that was a great, uh, great, great comment that I received from the group. So thank you, staff, for that, for assisting that presentation. And I'm gonna hold on to it and perhaps present it again in another conference. So thank you. Thank you. Other uh, comments? I know uh, we had a very busy summer and a very busy break, and there was a lot of uh, accolades that came to the city. A lot of big events like paying off, you know, uh, baseball stadiums and. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to try to take uh, maybe the next meeting or two, I'm going to take the opportunity to kind of just point out in case you missed it, some of the great things that happened over the last couple of months because there really were some no, noteworthy things. So uh, I'm not quite ready yet to, to share that, but uh, just so you know, I'm going to brag about us here in the next week or two when we tally everything up. Jen? Um, a, a lot of things have gone on th during our break, but I'd like to bring up a couple of things to acknowledge. Mesa Community Fridge uh, had their grand opening last week at Garden Pool, which is right here um, in a part of the Rancho del Arte building. And um, it's a community fridge in which if you have extra items and produce that you would like to contribute or you need produce or whatever, it's a small fridge, it's getting started, but it's a give and take um, fridge and um, available for anybody in the community. Uh, it's a tremendous program. I'd love to see it grow, so check it out when you have time on uh, uh, East Main. Um, and then... Uh, a few weeks ago, we did awards for the downtown improvement facade project in which several of our um, businesses along Main Street took advantage of a program that we had where the arcade was moved and exposed the beautiful historic nature of the building and added on a different uh, whether it be an awning or a patio area or a shade structure to really bring back the character of our downtown and it's been a very successful program so if you're downtown please check out what's happening at the nile they've uh, redone the frontage of their building national comedy theater the main street grill and oral brewing and we um, recognize them with awards and for uh, their um, contributions and being part of that program and um, we also uh, a few weeks ago launched the mesa move campaign for uh, to get citizen ideas for driving, biking, and walking throughout Mesa. And there's a two-minute survey online at mesaaz.gov backslash Mesa Moves. And I appreciate everybody can contribute so that we can make our um, streets more inviting. And um, I think that's about it for right now. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Just reminded me that maybe the, 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 did we open the Gilbert Road light rail uh, station uh, during the, the break here the last? It was actually May. It was in May. Okay. All right. So we did have an appreciation. That's kind of a big deal. We probably we need to make sure that we've uh, acknowledged, but we, we did. Yeah, that was breakfast. Well, we had the recognition. 
Oh, and thank you. You're right. We had it. Yes. Yeah. So just a couple of days ago, we 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 thanked the staff. That's been uh, much like the stadium uh, uh, bond defeasance. Uh, the, the light rail uh, is another issue that a lot of our staff has been working on for literally for years. And so, we expressed our appreciation to them for their hard work, and uh, want to do that again today. Thank you very much. It's a, a real point of pride for our city. Uh, anything else you'd like to go over, Council? All right, if not, the, uh, the uh, Mr. Brady, what's our schedule look like? Mayor, we'll see you uh, on Monday. We'll get things, keep things rolling. So uh, this coming Monday, the 19th, we'll begin, uh, uh, we'll have our study session and council meeting, so. Okay, great, thank you very much. If there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned.